guys, welcome to That Florida Feeling. How is everybody this week? It's good here, it's rainy, stormy. No, we're getting in the rainy season, we're almost there. So it's that typical afternoon, we're gonna blinding rain for 20 minutes and then the sun's gonna come out and it's gonna be super hot. You know, we're almost to that stage in Florida's uh, season. Thank you to everybody who has interacted with the Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok pages. I love the memes. I love that you guys share them. You guys are just awesome. Thank you so much. Again, thanks for making the podcast successful. I couldn't do it without you guys. Thanks everybody who participated in the poll question on Wednesday. And apparently a lot of people have real dislike for Miami. Um, you know, yeah, people just dis really dislike Miami and Palatka for some reason. If you don't know where Palatka is, it's probably not the worst thing. Um, if you do know where Palatka is, you might have mixed feelings on it. Miami is really its own beast. I'm actually in Miami right now, um, or close to it. And I can say it's a love-hate relationship. I can tell you right now. So today I want to talk to you guys about some of Florida's history. And of course, Florida's history hasn't always been nice. It's not. We know that. It's also not been a quiet history. It's not been a good history at some times. Um, The state's been filled with conflicts ever since the Spanish and the French tried to settle it while the Native Americans were already peacefully enjoying the Sunshine State. Um, You know, and Florida's got a really long history, and so a lot of it's actually conflict. And of course, Florida saw Spain and French fight it out, and they saw the Native Americans fight for their lands, and they saw the American colonies fight for their independence. And while all those wars were barely in or around, or somewhere in Florida, but not not a ton, um, they even saw the, you know, the U.S. go to war with themselves. Um, Florida, though, had its own war in the 1800s that is solely in the Sunshine State. And, of course, I'm talking about the Seminole Wars, or the Florida Wars, as they were completely within the boundaries of Florida. And they took place between the Seminoles and the newly formed United States. The wars took place between 1816 and 1858. Today, we're just going to talk about the first one. I cannot fit all three of them and the in-between times into one podcast. It is just way too much information, and I'm actually going to try to fit this one into 60 minutes. So let's see how I do. So let's start out with who were the Seminoles. I did an episode episode back earlier in the year, uh, I believe it was May, might have been the 1st of June, that looked into who the Seminoles were. So if you want a more in-depth answer than what I'm about to go get you, go listen to that. It's called um, Seminoles in the Lost State of Muskogee. Um, very informative. I actually did not realize who the Seminoles were until I did that episode. Um, and then I dug deeper into their history, and it involves the war. So the Seminoles were a tribe that was actually created out of many displaced tribes due to white settlers pushing them off their lands in Georgia, Alabama, and possibly a little further north into Tennessee and the Carolinas. And they came together from the different tribes, and this really started in the early 1700s in northern Florida when the territory was still under Spanish rule. Now, of course, when Spain ruled Florida, they ruled Pensacola and St. Augustine. Granted, they had more land than that, but those were the two strongholds. Um, they did have St. Mark's, but we'll talk about that later. Um, but so the, the Seminoles got pushed into Florida, uh, Northern Florida from all the white settlers and who were exploring and, or taking land. Um, and so they really didn't have a place to go. So they went South. And of course this is under Spanish rule and the Seminoles and the settlers in the newly formed United States really began to have more tensions in the 1800s because the Spanish really let the Seminoles do what they wanted. They didn't cause trouble for them. They didn't cause trouble for anybody. It was fine. They just kind of let them do their thing. But of course, the Seminoles and the settlers had issues because in the 1800s, slaves from Georgia began to escape into Florida and the Seminoles were actually welcoming them into their tribes. The Spanish did as well, but the U.S. had more issue with the Seminoles than the Spanish at this time. And, of course, the slave owners would go into Florida to look for their slaves, and this was a result in, you know, small skirmishes or fights between the Seminoles and the owners and, you know, the United States colonists. Um, And, of course, this would be really what led up to the first Seminole War. You know, people not respecting each other's boundaries, (laughs) which still happens today, maybe not in a war type. Actually, it is a war, uh, the Ukraine war. So, yeah, this still happens today. And of course, 
the U.S. Did really didn't make it better, and one person in particular that didn't help was Andrew Jackson. He didn't help tensions at all when he decided he was going to lead an expedition into Spain, Spanish territory, into, you know, New Spain, Spanish territory, Florida, against Spain's wishes. Now, when he did this expedition, he also decided he was going to destroy anything in his path, so he destroyed Seminole and Black Seminole towns. He even took over Pensacola for a brief period before leaving the territory. Now, if you know anything about Andrew Jackson, he is an absolute asshole. I don't have much nice to say about him. Um, But, of course, his expedition, and we're going to use that in quotation marks loosely, did not obviously help tensions with the Seminoles or the Spanish at this point. He was just really not helping anybody but himself, and I don't even really know if he helped himself. Now, of course, these tensions would continue to grow until somewhere between 1814 and 1816. They don't really have a definitive, this is what started it. Um, But that's the time when the tensions just erupted into an all-out war. Um, Of course, there's no actual start date. Uh, The first real fight, though, came during the Creek War from 1813 to 1814. So that's kind of where they think that the Seminole War kind of started. But again, nobody knows. Um, Colonel Andrew Jackson, back to being this, talking about this asshole, was actually cemented as a national hero after he was victorious in the Creek Wars, over the Creek Red Sticks, and by the way, they were given the name Red Sticks due to the red-painted clubs that they carried as warriors, and he cemented his national hero status at the Battle of Horseshoe Bend. The victory caused the Treaty of Fort Jackson to be forced in, to be forced onto the Creeks, which basically took most of the Creeks territory uh, in what would become southern Georgia and most of Alabama. And the treaty caused the Creeks to have to leave their land and migrate south into Spanish West Florida near Pensacola in the Panhandle. Well, now, of course, the Seminoles were already kind of forming at that time, and they were up in the Panhandle. And so, basically, the Creeks just kind of joined the Seminole tribe. Um, So, all these tribes came together to be known as the Seminoles. And, of course, the British were still fighting with the colonies in 1814 um, because they were still not giving up on having... You know, they lost the revolution. They were still not giving up on the stronghold. Uh, They wanted the colonies back, so they're still fighting. And when they did this, they also decided to start recruiting the Native Americans as allies against the newly formed United States. Um, The British actually moved into the panhandle near the mouth of the Apalachicola River and began to hand out firearms and ammo to any Seminole and Creek warriors, as well as fugitive slaves who were willing to fight against the U.S., And I guarantee you at this point, there's probably a lot of them. Um, And of course, as the British handed this out, they also began to build a a fort upriver at Prospect Bluff, which is now near Sumatra, Florida today. A company of Royal Marines were actually going to be stationed at this new fort and were moved to Pensacola in August of 1814. Captain Lockyer estimated at that time that in August of 1814, there were probably a thousand Indians in Pensacola And 700 of them were warriors, leaving the rest to be children and women. Um, But so they had amassed kind of a decent-sized little militia that they had armed against the U.S. just made out of of warriors. The Indians were, of course, ready to fight for uh, the British. They They were mad at the U.S. They kicked them out of their territory, and now they wanted to get even. So the Indians and the British were eventually, you know, would go to war, and they were eventually beaten back after an attack at Fort Boyer in Mobile. And, of course, this was led again by Andrew Jackson. And Andrew Jackson actually led them from Pensacola towards the fort that was still being built. So he was actually pushing them to their new stronghold. Now, of course, as we know, the War of 1812 eventually ended and the British left the Gulf of Mexico, except for one army that was led by Lieutenant Colonel Nichols in the Spanish West Florida, which is that fort. He was stationed at the fort on Prospect Bluffs. He had cannons, muskets, and ammo enough to hold his, his point, and he continued to work with Indians. He wanted them to get their land back. He wanted the British to get his land back, so they were all just pissed at the U.S. Um, he actually told the Indians that the tr- Treaty of Ghent would help return their lands, including the ones in Georgia and Alabama, so, you know, he was just, I don't know if it was the truth or he was just trying to get them to stay. Either way, the Seminoles no longer wanted to hold the fort, and went back to their villages. Uh, Nichols actually left in the spring of 1815, about a year later. But before he left, he turned the fort over to fugitive slaves 
and the Seminoles. So the Black Seminoles and the Seminoles were now holding a well-armed fort. Uh, of course, the word spread to the U.S. that the Seminoles and the slaves actually had a fort and ammo and artillery and firepower, all of the above, in their possession. And they started to call it Negro Fort. Yes, what a wonderful name. And of course, the Americans just were incensed by this. They saw this as an act against slavery because they thought that if the slaves knew that this fort existed, that it would cause a revolt and inspire slaves to escape to Florida. I'm pretty sure the slaves just wanted to escape in general. Um, But the U.S. knew that this was Spanish territory and that that fort set, you know, in Spanish territory. You can't just go get it, even though it's technically a perceived threat to them. But that doesn't stop people in April of 1816. Here we go again with Andrew Jackson. He told Governor Jose Massot of West Florida that if Spain did not destroy the fort, then he would be forced to come into their territory and do it himself. Governor told Jackson that he did not currently have forces to take the fort, but leave it alone. This angered Jackson. Jackson was not going to listen, so he assigned Brigadier General Edmund Pendleton, Gaines, to take control of the fort. Gaines first ordered um, that they should build a fort, Fort Scott, just north of the Florida border. So Gaines was going to build this fort and then supply it from New Orleans, that meant they had to go up the Apalachicola River past what they had named Negro Fort. And honestly, it was his way of keeping an eye on the fort. Plus, he knew that if they fort, if the fort fired shots on the boat, then they would have the ability to retaliate without having to have, like, you know, yeah, they can't just charge the fort. But if the fort fired first, yes, they can absolutely retaliate on this fort. So in July of 1816, a supply fleet reached Fort Scott with more than 100 American soldiers and 150 Lower Creek warriors. They included Chief White Warrior that were there to help the U.S. to protect the passage. The supply fleet met Colonel Duncan Lamont Clinch right outside of Negro Fort. He had two gunboats in position across from the fort to help them get supplies through the area. Now, the African Americans did fire cannons at the U.S. soldiers. But since they had no training, it was not effective. They did not know how to aim a weapon. So basically, it was just firing shots. Well, the U.S. was very effective and did know how to use cannons and was well and trained. And on the ninth shot, they used a hot shot, which a hot shot is basically a cannonball that's been heated to glow red, much more powerful, much more um, deadly. When they shot this hot shot, it landed directly in the powder room at the fort. You talk about a lucky shot. The resulting explosion could be heard 100 miles away in Pensacola, and it was called the single deadliest cannon shot in American history even to this day. The shot leveled the fort. There was 320 people known to be in the fort. 250 were killed instantly. Many more died soon from their injuries. The army then withdrew from Spanish Florida because it had destroyed the fort. There There was no more issue, right? There was no threat. And, of course, the Americans knew about the fort being destroyed, so they began to raid the Seminole camps, uh, taking the villages, killing the people, stealing the cattle, because they didn't have any way of protecting themselves. Well, of course, this caused resentment, and resentment continued to grow to the Seminoles. As this, ta- as this happened, they began to hate the white settler, and then they would retaliate by stealing back their own cattle and having their own raids and destroying property. A raid on February 24th, 1817, actually resulted in a woman and her two children being killed in Camden County, Georgia. Well, this was just what they needed to be pissed off. So, Fowlertown is a village in southwest Georgia that was near Fort Scott. Remember, Fort Scott is the fort they built to keep an eye on Negro Fort to supply, you know, to watch the Seminoles. So... Fowlertown is a village near Fort Scott. Chief Nemanthala of Fowlertown had already had a dispute with the commander at Fort Scott over the use of his land on the east side of the Flint River. Chief Nemanthala was claiming sovereign rights over the land. And the land in South Georgia, though, had unfortunately been seceded by, been ceded by the Creeks from previous treaties. But since he wasn't a Creek, he didn't see why he had to abide by this treaty. He just wanted them to get off his land. <laughs> 
On November 21, 1817, General Gaines had enough of the chief and sent a force of 250 men to seize Fowltown. The first attempt at seizing the village was actually not successful as the warriors had the upper hand. Well, the next day, on November 22nd, the U.S. forces were actually able to drive them from the village. And most people think that this foul town where they took it, they seized it, this is the beginning of the official start of the First Seminole War. So all the actions leading up to it, this is the final straw where the Seminoles got pissed and were done. They were, they were going to be in an all-out war with the whites. They were just done. And, of course, attacks became more frequent after Foul Town. They even attacked a boat with supplies on the Apalachicola River to stop it going f- to Fort Scott. The boat was carrying 50 people on board. One woman was taken prisoner. Six people survived, and the rest were massacred. So you're talking about 43 murders out of 50 people on board. Well, that pissed off the Americans. General Gaines was under orders at this time not to invade Florida, but decided that short, you know, short excursions into Florida would be okay, right? You know, that'd be fine. Um, The U.S. actually changed their mind about invading Florida, though, once the massacre had reached Washington. Once they heard that these 43 people had been killed on this boat, um, all bets were off. The U.S. was going into Florida. So Gaines was then immediately ordered to invade Florida to pursue Native Americans, but not to attack the Spanish. Don't touch the Spanish, just the Seminoles. Gaines had been called away to deal with pirates, though, before he could take on these orders. I'm sorry, I think it's funny. You have the Seminoles, you have um, the pirates, you have, I mean, it's just Florida. It's so Florida. Um, So when Gaines can do it, guess who the orders were transferred to? That's right, back to Andrew Jackson. So what does Jackson do? He gathers his forces at Fort Scott in March. Um, and this included about 850 U.S. Army men, 1,000 volunteers from Tennessee, 1,000 volunteers or 1,000 men from Georgia militia, and 1,400 Lower Creek warriors who were allies of the United States at this point. Jackson entered Florida on March 15, 1818, and marched straight down the banks of the Apalachicola River. He was going to waste no time. He reached the site of Negro Fort and constructed their own fort, Fort Gadsden, and then set their sights on the Misuki village around Lake Mikasuki. The Indian town, and I'm not going to say this right, I didn't say it in the other podcast episode, Anhyaka, Anhyaka, Anhyasi, I don't know. It's today, it's Tallahassee today, all right, Tallahassee today. Um, they burned this Indian town to the ground on March 31st, and then the next day they destroyed Miccosukee, uh, which is right outside of, Tal- of modern-day Tallahassee. They destroyed over 300 Indian homes, and then Jackson turned south towards Fort St. Marks, or San Marco, the other Spanish stronghold in the middle of the uh, panhandle. He reached that on March 6th, not March, sorry, April 6th. Jackson reached the fort, and he told the commandant of the fort, Commandant Don Francisco Casio y Luingo, that he had invaded Florida on orders from the President of the United States. He told him that after capturing the wife of Chief Chinabee, and that she had told him that the Seminoles were receiving ammo from Fort St. Marks, that he felt need he needed to go to this fort. He explained that because of this, the U.S. troop would be at the fort, um, because the fort was already full of um, the Miccosukian people, and they had run, they had fled. The Miccosukian fled to this fort when they, when Jackson had burned, basically their entire village and town and homes and everything they knew to the ground. He justified this though as an act of self-defense in taking the fort, and he used that as a friend of Spain. He was right to take over the fort since they were allies against the Seminoles. Uh, fun fact. The Spanish was not allied against the Seminoles. Uh, the Spanish had no problem with the Seminoles. Um, the Commandant agreed that they were friends, but denied giving the Seminoles any ammo from the fort and claiming that they had never tried to take ammo or possession of the fort. Uh, he told Jackson that he didn't like it and uh, he, would, he didn't like the challenges he would face if Jackson did, in fact, take over the fort because he needed more authorization from Spain and that would put him in a position of jeopardy with his within the Spanish military. I mean, this guy, literally, his fort was just taken over by Jackson, and, you know, that doesn't look good for him as a Spanish officer. Uh, Jackson did not give a shit, basically. He didn't listen. 
and he continued to seize the fourth on April 7th. He found out that uh, Alexander George Arbonoff was at the fort. Arbuthnot was a Scottish trader out of the Bahamas who traded with the Indians in Florida and had written letters to both the British and the Americans on behalf of the Indians. So you could say he was kind of a friend, even though he was also a trader who was making money. And he was actually rumored to be selling guns and ammo to the Indians to actually help them prepare for a war. Well, Jackson didn't like that. And uh, he wasn't going to he wasn't he wasn't going to deal with him. But what Jackson also found at the fort was two Indian leaders, uh, Josiah Francis or Hillis Hidalgo, Hillis Hadgo, and a Red Stick Creek known as the Prophet. They were both prisoners. He brought them out and hung them without trial. So basically, Andrew Jackson is now just making everybody mad. Of course, he wasn't done, though. He left St. Mark's to attack villages on the Suwannee River. Uh, those were actually mostly the black Seminoles and fugitive slaves. On April 12th, uh, the army found a red stick village on the Ecofina River, and it was raised and killed 40 warriors, captured 100 women and children, and found that one captive, that one woman that was taken captive on the massacre of the supply boat on the Apalachicola River from the previous November. So now again, he was a hero. They continued on, though. They found the villages in the Suwannee empty, around Suwannee empty, as many black Seminoles had left for the Tampa Bay area uh, to go to the maroon community of Angola. Um, basically, they were not going to stick around and wait for Jackson to, they were not going to be sitting ducks. So, he sent the Georgia militiamen home, as well as the Lower Creek Warriors, and the rest of the army returned with him to Fort St. Mark's, where they still held. The U.S. caught uh, Robert Ambrister, which was a self-appointed British agent, agent is in quotations, and put in front of a military tribunal. Ambrister and Arbonoff were both on trial, and they were both charged with aiding and abetting Seminoles and the Spanish, which caused a war against the U.S. Ambrister threw himself at the mercy of the court, and Arbonoff was like, no, screw you, I didn't do this. I'm not, I'm not guilty of what you've said I've done. So two very different approaches. Arbonoff claimed he was only making legal trades. Amberster was like, please have mercy on me. I'm an idiot. The tribunal (laughs) sentenced both men to death. Uh, But before it was carried out, Amberster was charged with 50 lashes and hard labor as a punishment. Jackson, of course, did not find this acceptable. He was like, no, we sentenced him to death. We're going to keep it as a death sentence. So he overruled it and put him back on, you know... Death Watch or whatever. I can't think of Death Row. That's the word. Death Row. Amberster was executed via firing squad on April 29th of 1818. And Arbonoff was hung from his own ship because Andrew Jackson apparently had a flair for the dramatic. Jackson soon left Fort Markson to return to Fort Gadsden. He was eventually going to attempt to return home to Nashville, Tennessee, if all remained peaceful. Jackson later reported that the Indians were, again, gathering supplies and being given supplies by the Spanish, so he left Fort Gaston to go to Pensacola on May 7th. He took a thousand men with him. The governor of West Florida protested that most of the Indians in Pensacola were only women and children, the men were unarmed, and that there was no reason to come. Well, that didn't stop Jackson. He continued on. He actually reached Pensacola by May 23rd. The Spanish governor and his 175-man Spanish garrison said, screw this, we're going to Fort Barnacus, Barnacus. Um, we're not staying here and dealing with you. So Jackson easily took the city of Pensacola. So now Jackson has taken two of the Spanish strongholds. The two sides, of course, exchanged cannon fire for a few days before the Spanish finally surrendered Fort Barrancas on May 28th. So basically now he's taken three. Uh, Jackson instated Colonel William King as military governor of West Florida and said, screw you guys, I'm going home. So he went home. Jackson's actions, though, did have consequences, especially internally in the U.S. government. I mean, he pissed off a ton of people. Secretary of State John Quincy Adams had just, just started negotiations with Spain for the purchase of Florida when Jackson started to invade the territory and take all over their strongholds. Obviously, Spain was <laughs> very, very not happy with this. Um, you know, they, Jackson had just taken over West Florida without cause because he perceived a threat. Which, were they a threat? If you came in their territory, probably. But, I mean, 
They were only doing what was done to them first, honestly. So, yeah, now Jackson's pissed off Spain. He's screwed up negotiations between the U.S. and Spain. Um, But, of course, Spain didn't actually have the forces to retaliate against the U.S. and or the ability to regain U.S. Florida by force. I mean, this is the point where you're talking where Spain is withdrawing from some of its colonies. Um, You know, they're stopping focusing on exploration, and they're really just building what they have. And Florida was never seen as a true... Like, it was never going to be a cash cow for Spain. It was never going to be... They were never going to create New Spain, or New Madrid, or New anything like that. You know, it was just a colony to show that they had and be held. Um, So... You know, Adams let him protest and stop negotiations before issuing a letter with 72 supporting documents. I mean, this guy is like, I'm going to tell you and I'm going to tell you why. He had 72 supporting documents when he issued them a letter that the U.S. was defending her national interest against Spain, British, and the Seminoles against the time of this invasion. Basically backing Jackson saying, look, he was right. This was a threat. We had to take care of it. It was in our best interest. We were not going to deal with this. He did apologize, however, for the seizure of West Florida. So he was saying, hey, sorry, he might have gotten a little overzealous. He claimed that normally not a U.S. policy to seize Spanish territory. um, And he offered to give it back. He offered to give back Fort St. Mark's and Pensacola as a goodwill gesture. Like, hey, we don't really need these. You know, we've kind of accomplished our mission. You want these back? You can have them. Of course, Spain eventually accepted the gesture and continued with the sale of Florida. And as you know, Florida was sold to the U.S. in 1821. Uh, Adams continued to defend Jackson's actions, stating that Spain either needed to control the Native American inhabitants of East Florida or give it to the U.S. Fun fact, when the state of Muskogee happened before the Seminole War, um, it showed that Spain was incapable, absolutely incapable of controlling this colony. Um, And that is really one of the main reasons that Spain probably decided to give up Florida, other than that they needed money. Um, When this person decided to create their own nation, um, and Spain did nothing about it, they couldn't, they could do nothing about it because they didn't have the people, the money, the effort, the manpower, any of it. Um, And then, of course, with the Seminoles attacking, you know, whatever they want, except they weren't attacking the Spanish, which is really funny, just the U.S., um... You know, it really kind of showed Spain that we don't have the manpower to hold this. Um, So, of course, they did agree, reach an agreement where the U.S. was given East Florida and the U.S. gave up all claims to West Florida. So, at this point, anything like uh, Panhandle West is still Spain. Anything like Panhandle East South, like the main part of what you think of Florida is now the U.S. So the U.S. now officially owns St. Augustine. And, of course, like Key West and Tampa and the places that were popping up and growing. Of course, Britain was also unhappy with Jackson's actions as they were upset that he executed two of their citizens who never actually entered into U.S. territory because, remember, at of the time they were executed, Florida was still a Spanish territory. Even in West Florida, it still remained a Spanish territory. Um... The British eventually asked for reparations, but seeing as they couldn't risk another war with the U.S. after having failed not only the revolution, but also the War of 1812, they eventually gave up because they wanted to remain in good standings with the U.S. for economic reasons. I think that's kind of funny, by the way, that they just were like, okay, you're right, our bad. Um, Of course, people in the U.S. were actually upset at Jackson for his actions. Um, The sham trial of... Uh, Amberster and Arthonaut, and then their executions subsequently um, was not helpful to Jackson's image. A lot of Americans actually supported Jackson at first, but then they felt he was becoming a new Napoleon and that he wanted to turn the U.S. into a military dictatorship. Um, Unfortunately, though, Jackson was never officially reprimanded for his actions in executing the men because he was far too popular. Now, did it stain his reputation? Absolutely. But it did not, did not stain it enough to stop him from becoming a president of the United States. 
Of course, tensions died down as Spain seceded Florida to the U.S. in 1821, which meant Spanish had no more control. The U.S. could control and do what they wanted with the territory, eventually making it a state. Um, and the effect of government was slow to come to Florida. So once the U.S. did actually take over Florida, it was akin to a shit show, basically. Um, Andrew Jackson was actually appointed military governor in March of 1821. He did not arrive in Pensacola until July of 1821, and then he resigned by October of 1821, having only actually officially set foot in Florida for three months. William P. Duvall, if Duvall sounds familiar, that's Jacksonville. William P. Duvall took over in April of 1822, the governor of Florida, and many followed in him. The governor of Florida actually had a high turnover rate and absences for its first few years as basically this was the new equivalent of the wild, wild west. Nobody wanted to deal with the Native Americans. Nobody wanted to deal with the colonists. Nobody wanted to deal with the runaway slaves. Nobody wanted to deal with Florida. And I feel like sometimes that is still true to this day because, well, let's face it, it's just Florida. Of course, the Seminoles never quietly went away. They remained a problem for their new government. They estimated that some 22,000 Seminoles and some 5,000 more black Seminoles were still in Florida, even after the First War. Um, Two-thirds of that number were actually thought to be refugees from the Creek Wars that actually migrated into Florida. And, of course, Indian settlements along Suwannee River and then south towards Alachua, the Alachua Prairie, and over by Tampa Bay were still there. They did not eradicate the Seminoles by any means. And, of course, officials in Florida were still concerned about the, Semin- the situation with the Seminoles. Um, because basically until a treaty was signed, the Indians weren't sure where they had their land. They couldn't plant their crops. They couldn't make their villages. They also had squatters in the form of white settlers coming to Florida to take, quote-unquote, their land. Um, so basically, it was kind of a free-for-all. It really was kind of like a version of the Wild West because, you know, you didn't have people. I mean, you had people, but they weren't everywhere, and you didn't have law everywhere, so people really were kind of doing whatever they wanted, and of course, people were trading at this time. There wasn't always a general store, so there was a lot of trading going on, and there was really no system for trading. Um, I mean, there were licensed traders. There were agents for people, but then there were also unlicensed traders who basically could hunt, fish, and trap, and then go sell their wares. So basically, all these traders... Uh, licensed and unlicensed are running all over Florida, supplying the Seminoles with a lot of things, including liquor at this time. Um, the government was pretty much so absent that most of the time when they would try to schedule a meeting with the Seminoles to create a treaty or any kind of semblance, they were canceled, rescheduled, moved, and then the Seminoles weren't told about it, so then it didn't happen, or then they just didn't happen at all. Um, 1823 is the year that the government finally decided, hey, we need to do something about this. So two years after they took over Florida and they were going to settle the Seminoles in the central part of Florida. And they met to negotiate a treaty at Maltry Creek, which is just south of St. Augustine. Um, 425 Seminoles actually attended the meeting and chose Chief Nimithala as their speaker. They negotiated that the Seminoles would go under the protection of the U.S. and give up all claims to land in the Florida Territory as long as they had land, as long as they had some land. So, you know, they couldn't go running around freely claiming all of Florida, but they needed a spot to call their own. So a reservation was created that ran down the center of the state from just north of what is now Ocala to the southern border, basically being um, on the same, I think it's longitude that goes sideways, Tampa Bay, the same southern point as Tampa Bay, the bottom of Tampa Bay, not the city, Not the city, the actual body of water called Tampa Bay, the bottom of the bay. So basically, the whole area that they were in is what is present-day Orlando, or I-4 corridor. Um, They did not extend the boundaries to the coast. They did this for a reason. They did this so it would prevent the Seminoles from trading with Bahama, the Bahamas or Cuba and or getting supplies and or help from other countries. They did allow... Nimenthala and five other chiefs to remain in the Apalachicola River region to the north as they had been there for so long. The government would supply farm implements, cattle, hogs, and other necessities as long as the Seminoles remained law-abiding and attempted to create their own uh, 
culture or continue their own culture. They would compensate them for time lost and travel as they moved to the reservation from wherever they were at in the state. And they would give up, they would give them rations for a year until the Seminoles could plant and harvest new crops. Now the U.S. was supposed to give them $5,000 a year for 20 years, as well as an interpreter for the tribes to be represented, a school, and a blacksmith for those 20 years to teach and learn. The Seminoles were had to, the Seminoles though had to give concessions. They had to allow roads to be built across the reser- reservations for people to get to and from other parts of Florida. And they had to apprehend and return any fugitive slaves in the area. Now Fort Brooks still existed in the Tampa area and was there basically to show the Seminoles that they were serious. You had to stay on your reservation. You know, we're the one we're the side of it and we're going to enforce that you can't come this way. You have to stay there. And, of course, the Seminoles were eventually unhappy with said terms and wanted to renegotiate in July of that year. Of course, the U.S., eventually fearing war again, ordered the militia to get the Seminoles onto the reservation by October 1st of 1824. The move had not begun when the Seminoles actually started receiving their payments as an incentive to get them to go ahead and move. It was their way of saying, Look, we're giving you this. Go do your go do your part. Um, they also sent rations to Fort Brooks. And of course, they moved a lot of them did move on to the reservation. Uh, but they were unhappy. A lot of them actually snuck back out and moved back to the panhandle <laughs> about a year after they moved to begin with. By 1826, most of the Seminoles had moved and stayed on the reservation, but the reservation was not flourishing, not like they told them it was. They had a drought which stopped them from having crops. Um, which actually led to some of the tribes starving to death. Um, even though they were given rations, it did not work. It did, they were not, there was no system of actually making sure that anything that was supposed to get done got done. Um, and of course, they still had the occasional issue with the whites and the slaves, uh, slave owners. Um, you know, the whites would think that they would they'd run off the land or they, they thought a slave was on the land and they wanted to go look for them. Um, you know, and they waited for help from the government while they slowly died on this new reservation. Uh, they eventually got a new treaty in 1832, and they were told now that they needed to move west of the Mississippi to settle with the Creek tribes. And this is out in Oklahoma. And of course, they did go and they did look at the land. And in 1833, they sent off that the land would be acceptable to move west. They returned to Florida and they denounced the signing of the treaty. They didn't want to leave. They did not actually want to give up the land that they knew as home. Five of the chiefs never even agreed to the move. The government was so fed up with Seminoles, they wanted the five chiefs refused to be removed as chiefs. They wanted them to be done. Now, Osceola was one of the warriors who spoke out against the whites and said that the Seminoles were turning into slaves. Now, you may have heard the name Osceola. It is a county in Florida, but it's, he's also a very well-known historical figure. Now, the governor of Florida at that time made Wiley Thompson an agent to the Seminoles during these changes. So he was supposed to be the go-between between between the Seminoles and the U.S. And he actually became friends with Osceola. And Thompson even gave Osceola a rifle after banning the sale of rifles and ammo to the Seminoles. He liked Osceola. He thought he was a good guy. He thought that, you know, he could befriend him. But when Osceola began to cause trouble, because that's what Osceola did, he didn't want to turn into what he perceived, you know, like the slaves... Thompson had no problem imprisoning him at Fort King for one night until Osceola agreed to abide by the new treaty that relocated them west and he was going to now bring his followers. He had to agree to it or he was going to basically be imprisoned for a very long time. Now the tensions continued to grow when white ranchers were out looking for their herd and they found an Indian campfire cooking what they presumed was one of their cattle. They whipped the Indians and while they were doing so more Indians arrived at their group. You know they were traveling groups. Um, When the Indians saw that the other ones were being whipped, they opened fire immediately on the whites and wounded three of the ranchers. This became a skirmish at Hickory Sink. This is when they realized that this is still not going as good as you want it to go. The Seminoles began to realize also that they were not going to receive any fair compensations or any help from the government after appealing to the government following the skirmish. So basically the government is now like, no, you screwed up. You know, we tried to help you. This was basically their excuse to stop helping them. Um, The Seminoles were also believed to have killed Private Dalton in August of 1835 as retaliation for the skirmish. Um, 
and a lack of help due to their relocation. Um, Private Dalton was supposed to be delivering mail from Fort Brooke to Fort King at the top of the Indian Reservation, and unfortunately, he was killed along the way. The summer of 1835 saw the Seminoles gather at Fort King in preparation to leave Florida, and they were going to be sent to Tampa Bay, then to New Orleans, then to go out west. The Seminoles ran into issues getting fair compensation for their land and the possessions that they could not take with them. Um, Now, the Seminoles actually did own some slaves, and they were going to try and sell them. They wanted fair compensation for that, for their livestock, for property that was too big to take with them. Um, They were also having issues getting proper clothing from the government. So, you know, this kind of pissed the Seminoles off again. They, Why are we leaving if you're not even going to do what you said? You know, if we have it okay here, why would I go out there if you're not going to help me there? If you're going to help me even less out there than you did here. November of 1835, the Seminoles considered uh, what Chief Charlie Imathala, Imathla, Imathla, sorry, Chief Charlie Imathla did as an act of betrayal. He sold all of his cattle and property at Fort King and was preparing to move his people to Fort Brooke as he did not want another war and he saw another war coming. He saw how they were being treated and he just wanted to leave. He wanted to get the hell out of there. Um, Now, the problem with what they saw as an act of betrayal was because the chief had sold his cattle. Um, Earlier, the council, the Seminole Council had said that any Seminole chief who sells their property, namely their cattle, would be sentenced to death. And he had sold his cattle. So we all know what's coming. Osceola was the very seminal warrior who killed this chief on his way back to his village, and he scattered the money over his body. The Seminoles were not preparing to move. They were preparing for a second round of war. So, there will be a part two. There will be a part three. There's three wars. Um, But there will be a part two. The Seminole War is a very huge part of Florida history. I mean, it really does depict how they were treated before this Florida was a state, even kind of when Florida became a state. Um, it's a very, it's a major part of Florida's history that we still need to talk about. I mean, are there Seminoles still in Florida? Yes. I talked about it in the other podcast. There are some near Fort Pierce. There are some south of Tampa. There are some near the Everglades. And there's, of course, some in towards Miami. The Seminoles are still a proud people. Um, there are some in Oklahoma. There are recognized tribes in Florida. Um, they did, you know, they, they fought for what they believed in. And they fought hard. And both sides won and lost accordingly. Um, So there will be a part two. It probably won't be next week. I'm going to break it up a little bit. Because the Seminole Wars are a lot of information. It's a lot of Florida history at once. I don't want to, like, overwhelm you guys. Um, So do look out for part two. We're not going to talk about Florida Man today. Because to me, Andrew Jackson is Florida Man. He is just such a freaking idiot. I did not like him. I lived in Tennessee. I have nothing good to say for this man. Um, so today our Florida man is Andrew Jackson. Um, so yeah, thank you for listening. I hope if you're interested in history, you found this somewhat interesting. Um, thanks again, guys, for supporting the podcast. If you haven't given it a five-star review on Spotify, I'd appreciate it. Or a five-star review and comment on Apple. Thanks again to everybody who's commented, who reaches out via any of the social media platforms. Um, I'm even in talks with some people via Twitter and email to get them on the podcast. And I think that's going to be a really awesome a uh, great thing. I look forward to having Floridians as guests and talking about different parts of it. And of course, learning more about Florida through other people. So don't feel afraid to reach out and say hi. Don't forget to post those memes. Um, Instagram, check it out. TikTok, you can see my little video of crabs crawling through the sand. I do not like sand spiders, so not a fan of that. But check it out. You can see daily life in Florida. All right, guys, don't forget to stay hydrated. It is the time of the year where you need to start carrying your umbrella. Always wear your sunscreen. And as always, guys, that is your daily dose of sunshine.